to the inner voice. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse Podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and we are coming off the heels of an excellent episode last week with John Monroe teaching us all the mastery about Qigong that he's developed over the years. And as luck or maybe chance would have it, in an unplanned synchronicity, as so often happens, we're going to be covering a very similar topic today with the very amazing Jason Quitt. Jason is a teacher of the mysteries and keeper of the sacred practices from ancient Egypt and other parts of the world too, as we can find synchronicity between so many of our ancestral uh, superpowers <laughs> when we look far enough back or look deep enough within. And that is how Jason developed most of the modalities that he's going to be talking about with us today, the Egyptian postures of power that he describes in this excellent book that you can find on his website. Uh, thecrystalsun.com. And he also gives a really great depiction of various aspects of Egyptian spirituality, which is so badly misconstrued by pop culture and Egyptology. It's refreshing every time we get to speak with and hear about a perspective that actually aligns with truth and source when it comes to this most uh, special and magnificent of cultures of ancient Egypt. So, as I uh, indicated, Jason learned a lot of what he knows through dream teachers, uh, past life memories, and all kinds of other mystical <laughs> mechanisms for accessing the inner knowing of his soul. And I'm really excited to get into it with him today. Make sure you check out thecrystalsun.com for more information about his book or to buy the book or to buy crystals and other implements from Jason and just keep up with him in general. Really excited to have him on, man. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the Interverse. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, this is going to be great. Yes, it is, man. So I did my best to introduce you there. But uh, if you got any, you got it. Can you take a better whack at it? Tell us who you are. Maybe a little bit of your backstory. Um, it's always strange hearing uh, <laughs> an introduction about yourself. Um, I would just say that um, I um, grew up thinking everything was completely normal, <laughs> thinking that my experiences were experiences that uh, a normal person would have. And then as I grew up, I started to learn that maybe what I was, what I was experiencing um, was not common. And this is when I started to talk to friends, I would say when I got into elementary school. So around, um, you know, from the ages of 10 to about 15 years old is when I started to realize that maybe um, the information or the things that I was ex experiencing uh, through life were a little different. So um, that kind of went away from me when I got into high school and just started to live a normal life. And um, when I got out of college and started to work um, with my friend in the real world, um, suddenly I started having spiritual experiences again. I started to have um, out-of-body experiences and contact. And I realized that what I was going through as a child, uh, even though it was shut off during certain parts of my life, it opened up again in my early 20s. And it took me on a completely different course in life. It changed everything for me. 
I had to look at things differently. And um, this is where I kind of got on this whole path of uh, learning about healing, learning about energy modalities, learning about shamanism, and then trying to go back into history to uncover, you know, where is the root of all this? Is this information available? And if it is, where has it gone? And that's how I kind of got into this community is just um, being, um, I guess, open with my experiences and also getting to meet people, going to different conferences and sharing these experiences with others. It kind of uh, gave me this fire to get out more and write my experiences, write what I know down and start sharing it with people. Very good, man. I, I can relate in a lot of ways. I remember when I was a little kid, I had this distinct thought of like, will it always be this way? Is there going to be a point where like, I forget what this was like, and I'm just like the the adults around me who don't seem to see and feel beyond sort of the basic physical things that are going on. It's really hard to describe because as a kid, you have no like dictionary for it. You just know that you just know that you seem to feel different than other people or that your, your mind works differently. Yeah. And, you know, I would say a lot of people that are sensitive, they do go through some type of traumas as as a child. Um, They go through hard situations where they have to kind of become more self-reliant or uh, be the adult in certain situations. And they kind of take on this other role Uh, where they feel like they're more mature. And this is where you get this kind of concept of this old soul from, because we connect, we have to learn and connect to our previous selves to understand from previous experiences, how to cope in certain situations is what I believe. And um, as a child, you know, when you start to experience the other worlds and you go and you tell an adult and say, you know, uh, I've experienced this, I see these things, or this thing really scared me, and you describe it, they would usually just say, oh, that's just a nightmare. And we all experience these things. We all experience these nightmares. It's just a dream, and don't worry, and go back. It's not going to hurt you. Um, So with that type of understanding as a child, you start to think, okay, this is completely normal. And then you go about your life like everybody is having these experiences. And I remember early on, my first type of experiences um, were paranormal, which I would say more like ghost experiences, shadow beings, things like that. But there was also this other dimension to it where it was all about past lives, where at very young ages, I would kind of go back or see certain lives where um it was always like at the point of death is the only way i could and and i still don't understand why but it's usually when you're seeing these past lives or experiencing them again it's usually the traumatic parts and it would always scare me because i would kind of see people going through a death process in various scenarios and then later in life, I start to learn that I was, that was me. You know, I was seeing myself transition and then going to the next life. Um, so growing up, you have these experiences. And I didn't find anybody that could really explain it to me. Is that you have this kind of knowing that this is what it is because you have this kind of inner guidance or this inner knowing of what's happening. But the first time that it really struck me that this wasn't normal is, um, and these are the memories that really stick with you is, uh, I'm trying to remember how old I was. I think I was around 11 years old and I just went into this new elementary school. So I didn't really know people. And there was one kid that I connected to that uh, we seem to become friends almost instantly. Uh, So it's like, great, I have like a new friend in this school that I don't really know people. And these memories started to come back of who this person was in a past life. And it was so vivid, it was so strong, and it was so emotional that it's like, 
once the memories all came back to me, the next time I saw this person, I was like, don't you remember who we were? Like, don't you remember who I am? Don't you remember who you were? And I was trying to like get them to remember who they were. And they, they couldn't, they're like, you know, Jay, uh, I don't remember what you're saying, but I believe certain things like that too. So I believe what you're saying, (laughs) you know, which is good. We're still very close friends, even to this day. So it's like, you have these soul connections uh, that go through lifetimes that I guess are very strong that when you come in contact with these people again in this life, something inside of you recognizes that and you're pulled to those people to support you in whatever journey you're going through. Yeah, that is amazing. I can't say that I ever had any kind of past life type mystical experiences. That's one that isn't a big part of my history, but out of body, um, sort of like, you know, prescient knowing of things that is very commonplace. And in particular, it was fascinating. I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but you talked about in an interview I heard you on with John Claude uh, at Beyond Mystic, having dreams where teachers come to you in the dream and actually show you things to do in terms of spiritual practices. And <laughs> after, after listening to that, it wasn't a day or two later that I had a dream very much like that, where I was receiving teaching inside this like temple cathedral from these uh, amazing priest, priestly like characters, not priests in like a creepy way, but <laughs> you know, they were all, they were very fancy. Uh, and I, and you know, they were just giving me like gnosis, just straight knowledge. And it's hard to even recall what I came back with from that. I wrote it all down and it's been a while, but that's one of the more fascinating parts of it to me is that you're going into these other realms of the dream and coming back with things that are life-changing and become your daily practices and you're teaching other people. Can we talk about that? Sure. And it's something that it's hard to believe unless you actually go there and experience, you know, so it's difficult to understand that where someone says, so where did you get this information from? And I can say, well, you know, I, you can see them on the statues from Egypt. You can see them standing in these postures, but that's not how I got it. I got it from uh, being taken in the middle of the night and maybe taken isn't the best word, but you know, you go to sleep and you kind of awaken in a, in a, in a altered state of consciousness, which you know, you're not dreaming and you find yourself in these places. Um, let's say like a temple, like you were saying, and you have a teacher there and this teacher is, uh, most of them don't talk. It's all telepathic. So you get this information internally. Uh, or they have instructions, very specific, let's say like postures or certain meditations, or even what plants to pick and put together for medicine. You know, so you have these kind of like teachers on the other side that will give you this information. And then when you wake up, it's so vivid, you can write it down and say, okay, this was important. There, there was something here that was very valuable that was given to me. Um, so you write it down, and you start to practice it, and you start to learn what you're going through. Um, I would say that there's places that are kind of like astral temples or astral schools. And I've never gone there uh, with intention of going there. It's always like, you're just, you just wake up there. Okay. Um, So I originally, when I started to get the Egyptian postures, I never even thought about Egypt. I was not even researching it. I had no desire to even know anything about Egypt, but I was taken there and realized that I had a very strong connection to this information and that this information is now being taught to me. And that kind of opened me up to this whole realm of this Egyptian information. but. You know, I've been taken to temples um, that would be considered, um, let's say, like Hindu temples, uh, Buddhist like temples, uh, ancient Chinese temples, 
And I've had teachers that, you know, I don't really know who they are because they don't really come and say, I am this person. Here you go. (laughs) Here's the information. You're just presented with some being that you feel some type of connection to or good resonance to. And they start to speak with you or present information. And sometimes it's very um, strange, like there's an experience where I'd feel something is in my room and I would wake up in the astral and let's say there would be like a monk standing there and it looks like a Chinese monk with, uh, you know, the, the orange robe and they come and they sat on the bed and they open a book and they're showing me these Qigong postures in a book. And they're like really amazing Qigong postures. Like this is the posture to levitate. And this is the posture for manifestation and all this stuff. Right. And then I'm like, this is the most amazing thing ever. And then I wake up and I don't remember a single thing. I remember the interaction. I remember the book, but then when I wake up, I don't remember anything that's in the book, you know? So it's like, you have these experiences that you wish you could retain, but then I guess it's stored in the astral body, it's stored in the astral mind, uh, and you can access it when you can. But then there are certain things that stick with your memory that you can't shake. Like I remember things from the earliest of my childhood, but I can't remember most of my childhood. But I remember those things, you know. Um, I hope that kind of answered the question. I I think we went way off there. (laughs) No, man, this is what I'm here for. (laughs) There is no off. We are totally on. And actually, I remember some more of that dream that I had right after hearing you speak with JC. What uh, what happened was the teachers were explaining to me how to access deeper levels of lucidity in the dream. Now I remember. And there was a then they like made a bed up here in front of me and they're like, okay, now try. And so while I was in the dream, I went to sleep. And went into another level of dream and started practicing what they were teaching me, including things like flying around and flying in my dreams is pretty much the the standard. But yeah, it, it was amazing. And I was wondering, too, if you were doing anything to enhance dreaming during the times where you receive those type of teachings like mugwort or do you think it's related to your spiritual practices? Um, I was doing nothing when these things started happening. All right. So there was nothing on my mind. There was nothing I was taking. Um, At the time, I was uh, making a lot of music. I think music could help activate things as well. Um, But that's basically it. Um, I would say that later on, you know, um, you know, I read a lot of books on, you know, Terrence McKenna and uh, different medicines you could take to try to enhance things. And then I went down that journey as well as trying different uh, shamanic journeys and medicines uh, to see if I could leave my body that way or get information that way. And I felt it was a completely different experience. And it's, it's good in its own place, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I was experiencing. Um, So for me, Um, I found that just doing a daily practice, let's say like Qigong or meditation, having a healthy lifestyle, getting out and walking, I think being in nature and just breathing air is probably the best foundation for you to have these experiences. And every time I put my mind to, I really want this to happen, it never happens. You know, so it's like when you're trying to chase something, it's running away from you. So my whole thing is the opposite. Um, I don't ask to leave my body. I don't ask for messages to come to me. I don't ask for anything. I just go to sleep like a normal person at night. And if the experience happens, the experience happens. But you have to kind of catch yourself because. It really has to do with feeling. This is what I stress mostly with people. It's not, it's not um, something that you initiate. It's something that you observe 
and then go with it. Okay, so uh, for example, if I'm going to sleep at night, sometimes you just fall asleep, you go right to sleep. And sometimes you're going to sleep and you can actually feel yourself dropping into your body. You could feel yourself, your body going to sleep, but your mind is still active. And you could feel the separation of states. So you know you're dropping into different states of consciousness. And when you get that awareness, you say, okay, I can feel I'm dropping into this awareness. Now I could leave. I could will myself. I could do something different than just going to sleep. So there's a feeling involved. There's a process involved that happens and you're along for the, the adventure, basically. That is exactly how it has happened for me in times where I've done out of body. But I believe for a lot of us, because this is what my experience was, that when that state change happens and the body falls asleep, but my mind stays aware instead of also sort of shutting off consciousness. The first many times that happened, it was like scary and maybe akin to what people describe as sleep paralysis. And I kept fighting it and I would try to wiggle my toes or move or scream or do anything to break the paralysis. And then I remember the first time that I got this voice, this female voice just like came into my ears as if I heard it out loud while I was in this in between state. And it was like, go with the flow. And instead of trying to shake myself awake, I was like, okay, because during that paralysis, you get this, it feels like this electricity, like a plug is just, uh, plugged into the back of my neck. And so what I did was I just went into that feeling and then that lifted me out of my body. And then the next thing I knew, I'm like up by the ceiling fan, looking down at myself. <laughs> the experience only lasts for as long as you can hold your attention. So I think part of maybe developing further in that realm of, um, you know, mystical out of body lucidity has to do with how long you can hold your attention without falling into a distracted thought or, you know, something unconscious taking over, which is where meditation is so helpful. Yes, because, um, and you just described it absolutely perfect. Um, when you go into it and it is, it is a paralysis. Like people, there is no difference between sleep paralysis and the outer body experience. Sleep paralysis is the catalyst to leaving your body. Your body has to be paralyzed. You have to be awake and you have to kind of break that shell. You know, it's the, it's the, uh, the mystical egg, you know, your body is the egg and your, your soul cracks that egg and leaves to be born again, basically in the other world. The, the issue is, is that when the astral body wakes up, you're basically a child. You don't know anything, <laughs> you know? So you have this uh, other type of guidance with you, like that voice that spoke with you, that's watching over you, that, that is kind of easing you into the experience and kind of watching you and you only get small tastes of it. And what you have to do is through different practices of leaving your body and energy practices like the Qigong and meditation, what you're doing is you're building that astral body, you're building that um, electromagnetic field that now you are capable to hold that attention for longer periods of time and also face that world. Because as a child, you're pretty open to... Um, trouble you know there's things in there that could be uh, pulling at you in the wrong way so um, and that's why a lot of people get messed up when they first started leaving their body and they're like we'll never ever do this again because this is dark this is you know evil and demons and all this stuff and and there is a stage where you have to kind of face your shadows. You have to face yourself and the world that's presented to you on that side. It really is a reflection of your consciousness first, then it's the collective consciousness as well. So you have to kind of face these things right away to learn how to navigate it. And that could be uh, very troublesome to many people. Um, so that's why it takes many, many years 
of doing this to try to get like a foothold of understanding of how you do it. Is it safe? What are these things that come to us? And I really do believe that we are protected. Like that voice that came to you. It's like, there is a voice. There is something with you on these journeys. And maybe it's multiple things, multiple guides, multiple guardians or protectors that are now with you that say it's time for you to experience something. It's time for you to know something more. And we're here to guide you. Um, Because there was more experiences that I could count that were horrifying. You know, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to write another book or oh. sometimes just bewildering, <laughs> like, you know, like it's not really positive or negative. It just makes no sense. Like you, I remember one time I, I saw these like uh, toddlers, I thought, and they were looking down on a sidewalk trying to pick something up and I went to help them. And this is just in this astral state. Yeah. yeah. And then they look up at me and they're actually raccoons on stilts stacked three high. And I'm just like, why am I, <laughs> I have no idea why I'm seeing this. And then it kind of, I was like, wow. And then it just snapped away. You never know. It all kinds of weird stuff there. Right. So it's, it's very difficult to interpret and we have to, we tell people it's also like a dream. Like what you just described is like a dream. It just doesn't make any sense. It's, and you have to kind of navigate that world like it's uh, fluid. All right. It's not like this linear time space where um, things make sense. It's like you can be it's just like a dream. You can be sitting uh, in your bedroom uh, and then suddenly you turn your head and you're on a beach. You know, it's like instantaneous transformation from thought, basically. So um, it could be very confusing. And another thing about these experiences is they are more real than physical reality. And this is what gets a lot of people is that uh, the first time someone leaves their body, it's so real for them. It's like earth shatter. It's, it's so real that it feels more real than physical reality. You know, it's like, you know, this is real. So when people first have this experience, either from a near death experience or a spontaneous out of body experiences, um, they feel that it's a physical thing that's happening to them. They have a physical body. They're physically in that space. They physically feel and sense everything just like they're in a normal human body. So it's very difficult to separate the two experiences of being physical and being non-physical, which is, yeah, what I think a lot of these alien abductions are. It's not a physical thing. It's an out of body experience. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I really like Carl Jung's way of explaining the psyche with his whole theory about the male having a female anima internally, a female soul that is part of them, and vice versa, the animus for the for the external female having a male guide or soul because in those there's been many times where in that sleep paralysis state even if i didn't launch into an out of body i can remember many times where like this i always just thought it was a goddess <laughs> would talk to me in my head between the waking and sleeping state and i usually don't remember what i'm told but it always was like this <laughs> it, I, it always carried the feeling of like these were the answers i was looking for about life the universe and everything but maybe not something that you can hold in this particular form, the equation of the universe, because we are in these sort of yin yang containers where whatever we're doing, we get 180 degrees. Like (laughs) if that makes sense, you can only see 180 degrees at any given time, but in the mystical state, in the meditation state, even uh, you can begin to experience 360 degrees, like seeing the whole room around you or like when you, tell your story of the bad injury that you received and how you're doing breathing techniques to self heal and like going to the beach while laid up in bed and how, how real that was for you. I think that would be cool to talk on and touch on how 
how simple it is to activate the self-healing and even have miraculous recovery from what the Western doctors might diagnose as like uh, unbeatable or a very long road, that type of thing. Yes. And I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And uh, not only have I seen miracles in myself, but I've seen miracles in other people. And I don't like to give examples because it's like, you know, every person is unique and they have their own thing. But uh, like, you know, a simple thing. And these things just fill fill me with joy is uh, I was um, at um, a health show and this young lady came up to me and never met her before. And she says, I really have to thank you for your work with the Egyptian postures. And I said, oh, you know, thank you. And I didn't really think much about it. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. My whole life, I was deaf in the right ear. My whole life, I was deaf in the right ear and I was doing your postures. And a couple months after doing your postures, now I hear. It's completely black. And that's just like one. There's, there's so many other things that have happened to people doing meditation, doing postures. And it's not about me. <laughs> you know, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the way uh, the body moves and stores energy. So if we're um, allowing things to move in a certain way again, miracles can happen. You know, it's not the person, it's the person doing the exercises of meditation. Um, when it comes to uh, visualization, like you said, when you're saying 360, I would say that is part of the astral vision, All right? Because we really don't have eyes in the spiritual form. You are an eye, basically, you're a 360 vision and you don't actually have to leave your body completely to have this ability. Um, it's like once you learn to get out, um, sometimes things you'll hear things coming into your room, which is, you know, beings, ghosts, guides, whatever they are. And your, your face could be in your pillow sleeping and you can just pop your astral head out you don't have to leave. You just have to like pop your astral head out and suddenly you see around full 360 in the room and you can communicate. You, know, you don't, that's as much as you need to do. And it's not just 3D vision. There's this effect and it's, it's a very strange but awesome effect. It's a zoom feature. Okay, it's like if you said you want to see a crystal on the table at the other end of the room, it's like you can zoom into it and you can keep going into that crystal. Yeah. And then there's like seeing the front and back of things at the same time or seeing the outside and inside at the same time. It gets pretty incredible. Right. So it's a different type of vision. It's a different type of experience. <laughs> and um, when it comes to self-healing is I, I personally believe that the human body has a mechanism. It's a built-in mechanism, just like an immune system, but it's for traumas and healing. And that once you reach a certain threshold of trauma, this natural instinct, this natural survival mechanism can kick in and it, it has this spontaneous or miraculous healing effect. And I think every single person has this. Um, and the way that I've accessed it is obviously through traumas. <laughs> um, I have broken my back before. I've had terrible injuries in my past where I've had to kind of use these things. And I did go to the hospital. I did get surgery. You know, there's a place for physical trauma. You know, if I break my leg, I'm going to the hospital and getting a cast. You know, I'm not going to sit there and, you know, breathe the bone back together. You know, that's, that's, you know, a normal thing to do. But after you get patched up by the doctors and they send you home, you're basically on your own to take care of yourself. Uh, you're basically um, your healer. It's as simple as that. So 
there are exercises like the breathing exercises that activate certain centers of the body. You have the lower dantian, which is behind your uh, belly button. You have your heart and you have your mind and they all have to kind of work in, in sync. And it's through this regulation of the breath um, that we can connect all three of these centers. And the way that I found that you can do this is with the mind. The mind is the most important element of this because when I, when I say mind, I mean awareness. You take your awareness and you place it in the air. So your mind is now the breath. It's now the air. And as your mind, you take the mind, you place it in the air. So you're experiencing your mind as the breath going through the nose, through the centers, down through the heart, down into the lower dantian. And then you, you hold it, you, you breathe it in and you hold that awareness. It's like you are that breath that you're holding in and it's basically the universal breath. And then you breathe it back out and you follow the awareness of it coming back out. And by doing that, it's almost like you change the nature of air from just simple air to what would be called prana or life force or the, the divine fire. It's like you're, you're, you're completely transforming it into something else. And as it starts to build into these areas, it has um, a feeling, it has a sensation, it becomes very warm, it becomes very tingly, and uh, it moves to different areas. And once you get into this awareness of this feeling of energy that you've created now in the body, again, using the mind and the will of the heart, you go deep into the Dantian area and you move that energy. You move that field of energy to the place of your body where that trauma is. And it's like, it's, it's hard to describe the feeling of it. I tell but, people that if you can't feel it yeah. at first, imagine what it, what you think it would feel like. And just keep imagining a feeling. And it's actually, you know, putting your mind and attention into your body to feel is not really any different than imagining. We're working with the same mechanism here. So then if you get a habit of imagining what it would feel like, eventually you've created a type of language for your body to express to you through feeling. And you'll start to feel it naturally without, you're not even faking it, but without, you know, imagining it primarily, if that makes sense. That's right. And it's, it's hard to, to describe, but because sometimes there's pain associated with it. And that, that's also what turns people off with it. You know, some people will go to a healer and they'll start to move their energy and there would be a lot of pain associated with that. And they'll say, I'm never doing that again because this person hurt me. You know, the, there is pain. Like when I broke my back and I was doing this exercise, when I would build the energy and it would become like fire and then I'd put it on the spot of my spine that was broken. Uh, it, it took my pain from, let's say a level of six, seven to like the top of 10, right? It was, you know, like pass out pain. And I would feel the muscles spasming. I'd feel things popping and moving. So it was, it was quite painful and, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive where it's like, instead of trying to stop the pain, you're actually trying to make the pain worse, <laughs> you know, to feel it and experience it and go there. And it's like, um, well, I'll tell you another experience. Um, I've always had back problems my whole life. I'm, I, I had a growth spurt uh, very early on and I'm about six, four. I think of my tallest, maybe I was about six, five, <laughs> if I stood up straight and, um, you know, there's pictures of me in elementary school where all the students were still children and I was taller than, than the teacher, you know? So it's like, I grew 
I was always, there was a part of my life where I was always picked first for sports, <laughs> you know? And, um, in my early twenties, I, um, I was doing yard work and I slipped a disc in my lower back and it was like the worst pain ever. And it's like, I was walking with the cane for like three months. Like it was terrible. I was in bed for a long time. I couldn't move. And, um, one day I just had enough and I had this kind of, uh, electromagnetic Tesla field generator. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to like turn this on. And I put it at the highest setting that it can go to. And I just put it on my back and I said, this is enough. I'm done with this. I got to get rid of this pain. And so I, you know, I did all the breathing. I did all the intentions and work and I focused on the pain and I put the Tesla machine on and the pain again, it went to like a 10 and I knew that, um, I had to focus on the pain and experience the pain as much as possible. And that's the kind of an old shamanic ideology is that, you know, the pain is the messenger and you have to listen to it. You don't push it away. You become the pain and it transforms that. The pain is your body asking for attention and thus energy, wherever your attention goes, energy flows. So <laughs> like I used to stub my toe all the time before I got a Qigong practice. I and what's funny is that body awareness. Now I like never do that. But if for any reason, then I, I remember learning specifically like almost a uh, intuitive knowing at one point unlocked for me that if I ever got hurt, just put my mind directly where it hurts. And it actually, because otherwise you're like rejecting it. And that's how you store trauma in the body is by trying to ignore the pain or numb out the pain or run away from it. Right. Yeah. So you really have to become that pain and go right there. And it, the pain actually has this life force to it. It's alive. It breathes, it pulsates, you know, it has this heat to it. Yeah. It's electricity. Yeah. So I, I was focusing on my lower back with this Tesla machine and it's like, cause I couldn't move. I was in so much pain and I felt this um, it was like a pop. That's all I could describe it. It was like this pop that happened in my lower back. And then it felt like warm honey. So all I could describe is like really warm honey got released and I could feel it very slowly. Like it didn't move fast. It slowly went down both my legs and out my feet. Like it was this total full body experience where I felt Exactly that. It was like this warm honey in my body moved out through my legs. And then right after that experience, the pain was gone and it never came back. And it was this kind of eureka moment where I was like, pain is energy. And if we deal with it in a proper way, it releases itself from the body. And that's what that honey feeling was that warm, honey, viscous liquid, whatever it was moving inside the body through the legs out through the feet. And suddenly it was gone. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of these experiences where if you listen to your body, if you have that connection and I guess you go through a certain process, these things will kind of fix themselves or the body is capable to have that healing process happen. You know, and like you said, we're usually running away from it. Yeah. The body is the only thing that heals, not medicine, not <laughs> first aid. None of that is the body does the job. You know, the best we can do is give the body the right conditions for it to do its job. Attention being the first condition. Um, nutrition being a huge condition, grounding. What you're describing, though, makes me really think of the dichotomy in Egyptian mythology between Sekhmet and Bastet. Sekhmet represent, they both represent healing, but Sekhmet is also like this ferocious lion-headed goddess who rips you to shreds. <laughs> so what her version of healing is she brings the pain that is necessary for healing to occur 
And then Bastet is like that honey dripping down into the ground, the relieving part of healing. Uh, that's how I understand it. Bastet's more like a sweet kitty cat and Sekhmet's like a ferocious, terrifying lion, right? I just love how they use cats because it's so true. You know, cats are healing in themselves. Um, but that's exactly it. And it's also a shamanic concept where um, to heal a lot of these, um, let's say ayahuasca journeys or San Pedro or peyote or, or any of these uh, psychedelic plant medicines, uh, many people report this type of um, decomposition of the body. As in, it's like when they leave the body, suddenly these animals, ferocious beasts, demons, things, you know, horrible, horrible things come to you and basically rip you to shreds and eat every part of your body. So it's a horrible experience. But then the body is then rebuilt anew and you come back from the journey without those traumas, without those things. It's the same thing from like the Egyptian book of the dead where um, Anubis, you know, takes the heart and throws it to the crocodile beast um, to be consumed. Uh, and it was like, okay, that's horrible, but it's not horrible. It's, it's like taking the negative karma built up, the negative energies and allowing the beasts to consume it so that you can be born anew and fresh and walk forward. And that's also the point of what I believe is the original concept of hell. When you're going through, um, like in the book of gates or the, the Egyptian book of the dead or you know, all these ancient texts, it's like when you're going through this kind of underworld experience, there's usually 12 gates that you have to pass through. And at each gate, it's like there are guardians that are demons, basically. And these guardians will not let you pass until you, have, you are able to. And uh, even in the, some of the earliest literature, like from the Book of Gates, that soul or that person passing through has to go into the lake of fire. Like that's where it comes from. And the lake of fire was not this eternal suffering thing. It was, um, it was alchemy. It was like you enter the fire to be purified of the sins that you carry. And then through that purification process, you can now pass through the next gate. You know? Yeah, man. <laughs> sin, I've been defining sin as anything that makes you weaker. So it's a blessing to go through those crucibles. And for me, the uh, shamanic dismemberment experience, it was a shark <laughs> just tore me to shreds. And then like this monkey put me back together with crystals in my body. So, so you, went, you went through that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was not spontaneous. So, well, it was, but like at the time I was practicing shamanic journey with drum and rattle, totally like sober and everything and trying to contact the uh, lower world animal guides and that's what happened and in this experience they put me back together with selenite so i have like this sort of qigong healing ability to project or manifest the vibration of selenite without having it on hand <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty awesome yeah i recommend people do the shamanic journeying practice of at least a few times and see if you can make contact with some spirit animals or or other guides because they're there. It's a fascinating, fascinating exercise. But I want to, you brought up cats and how they self heal. I was thinking about how they purr. And I'm, I'm a sound healer, which I use tuning forks by trade. Yes. I was wondering if you had any knowledge on like, <laughs> this is a crazy tuning fork. I know. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any knowledge on the use of sound for healing in ancient Egypt. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. You, that's a serious tool <laughs> you're holding geez yeah um thank you to my audience for crowdfunding this thing for me oh really man. appreciate it no no that is cool um yeah i got some bowls even sitting here Ugh. you know you never leave home without them right um, yeah you gotta pack a bowl you gotta pack a bowl <laughs> yeah i guess so and uh, <laughs> uh in ancient egypt Remember, um, 
there's this, it's not just a philosophy. It's a way of seeing yourself in the world as everything is resonance. Everything is vibration. It's just like Nikola Tesla said, and everything is based on these harmonics. So the mind, the way we think sets up fields. Um, sometimes you can measure it, let's say with like a, uh, what is it, the ECG with the mind. But we're talking about spiritual energies here, things that can't really be measured. And with the disease in the body, thought forms, motions, they're all based on frequency. They're all placed in certain ranges of octaves and harmonies. So to access these things or to even go through healing, sometimes a tone sacred music, sacred song. Like if you go to uh, different journeys, shamanic journeys, there are certain songs associated with certain types of healings. So if you have grief, there's a song, if there's a, you know, um, like loss and pain and fear, there's these different songs that would be sung to you to help bring that out. And it's the same thing um, in Egypt, um, in fact, science right now is seeing that certain chambers um, were designed with uh, frequency in mind. There would be different resonances in each chamber. So as a air passes through the different vents, there would be uh, you could actually register the different frequencies of the different rooms. And by spending time in those rooms, it would kind of allow the healing process to, to go through. Um, but this also goes to um, a concept called the Ren, uh, which is the name, which is not just a name. All right. So uh, one of the most sacred things, and it was part of the bodies of hum humanity and everything else, you, it was part of the gods and everything to even to the mineral worlds. Um, everything had a name. And if you knew that name, you had power over it. So this was like the beginning concept of magic, right? You know, it's like the magic word or the magic spell. As it has gone on today and even been twisted into an inverted form in the way that like your name lets you be registered with the government and tracked everywhere. You know what I mean? Yes. So by, by knowing the actual name gave you power over it. And this is why sacred names were never spoken, never told. And um, it's like when you're born, for example, um, you are given a spiritual name, which is yours. Like you, nobody knows this name except you. And then your family gives you a name. And when you start going through initiations or start opening your up to these spiritual forces, um, you may receive sometimes that name. The problem is, is that that name gives you your power back. Okay. But you can never give that name out in public or to anybody because if anybody gets that name, they have now power over you. And this is this whole concept. And it's the same with sounds. All right. So, we're talking a name is a vibrational code. And in ancient times, these mystics would try to learn the names that are associated with nature. You know, what name does this rock have? What name does this animal have? What name does this plant have? And the moment they receive that name, suddenly they have this magic. And they can speak directly to these things. Um, and it's also the same thing going back to what you're saying with vibration and music in ancient Egypt is by saying secret words to the body. These masters could heal people. You know, and they say, well, how. It's just a. I would say it's a it's a science that we have not figured out in our world yet. And it's so powerful, but it makes complete sense um, that, you know, this is the most hidden knowledge is these secret or sacred words. 
Yeah, that is a fascinating subject. And I also do think that intention maybe is as weighty as the word itself in a lot of sense. Like maybe part of what made though maybe part of what made those masters so effective with their word is how clear they could become and single pointed in focus on a particular intention. Maybe they think probably that has something to do with it, but that, that whole mystery of the Rin, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. The secret name, the mystery name, my story, my, you know, the, even in the legal sense, I do a lot of study on sort of the occult aspects of the legal system. And it is wild how much it mirrors spiritual reality, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which makes sense because the whole thing is at the root based on the King James Bible, but there's this uh, concept of the public and the private. And a lot of our issues with having rights infringed on has to do with us acting publicly versus retaining our private um, sovereignty. <laughs> so that is very interesting about the, the Ren thing. And I know the uh, Egyptian uh, mystery tradition would give the initiate a new name oftentimes and a new, even a new birth chart, potentially like at the time of the new naming to maybe compensate for issues with the previous birth chart. But we got about five minutes in the first hour and it's such an interesting subject, but I want to make sure that you have, and you don't have to rush it, but if we go over five more minutes, that's okay. But I want to make sure you have time to tell people about your book and why they might want to explore the postures of power. I meant to give more time to that in the free hour, but these have just been such good tangents. <laughs> sure. Um, well, what we're talking about is all in this book. And um, this is the information that I've been working with for almost 20 years now. And I just finally got it all into one book and made it very simple. And I'm very happy that you got the book and read the book. Um, because this is like my, the basis of this knowledge that we're talking about. So, um, I would say it's a tool and not just information. You know, it's, it's good to read about certain spiritual concepts, but it's another thing to have it in a tool bag for the future. So it's not just spiritual concepts. It's how to apply these spiritual concepts in the real world and how to experience and build the energies using very ancient ideas about how energy works, how energy flows in our connection to the universe, because all the mysteries really are is understanding the reflection of the human being to the infinite. And it's the moment we start to see ourselves as the infinite within the human experience, um, things really start to open up and change. And my friend Danny yeah. likes to use the word omniscopic as an upgrade to infinite. <laughs> You know, exactly. and that describes what you're saying, because it's about seeing the reflection, omniscopic, seeing the all. Yeah. And everybody is their own unique song. You know, they're all their own universe, one song, your, your unique experience. But the way the world operates follows laws. And once we start to see these laws, then we understand the flow of nature and we place ourselves in the flow of nature, in the flow of these laws, and suddenly things become clear to you. So it's a way of stepping back into your true self, which is the infinite self, where you're in the laws of nature, in the laws of your sovereignty, in the laws of everything that you're speaking about, um, and seeing it from a completely different perspective. Yeah. And I'll just add that in this book, you will learn breath work techniques, meditation techniques, very well explained. You know, a lot of times in books like this, it's almost, <laughs> and your book isn't like this, but a lot of spiritual sort of self-help type books, they'll, it's almost like this cookie cutter formula of a bit of exposition and writing and life story. And then a practice and an explanation of the practice and the chapters are all formatted that way. But I like how you did it. You lay out this book with about the first half is uh, it be, it's got your 
story and how that, and then it's got the Egyptian mythology and various Egyptian belief systems of spirituality. And that's about half the book. And then some uh, spiritual tools that one can use resources like smudges and things like that. And then you go into, then you have the second half of the book, which is the techniques, the postures of power, the breathing techniques, the meditations, and they're very well explained. A lot of times the books that are in maybe this genre, you could say, uh, <laughs> that's just so wordy about how like the, the technique, the meditation techniques are so wordy. Like how can you actually read, read this and then remember all those instructions and then go into the meditation. It's like a lot of people probably just never even do those and they just read the book, but yours is accessible. And you know, there's imagery in here that will show you how to do these postures. And we may talk more about the postures in part two, but I just want people to know that if they go to the crystalsun.com, I'm sure they can find links to other interviews you've done where you talk more ex extensively about the postures. It's a very good compliment to a morning routine. They can be done fairly quickly or you can extend it out. There's a lot to it. So is there anything else you want to add to that about your website or the book or the postures of power? Um, I would just say that when it comes to Qigong or postures or breath work, what we're speaking about is the literal foundation of all energy work and all energy work systems. So you can be, um, working on any type of system. You could be doing Reiki, you could be doing channeling, you could be doing uh, any practice. It doesn't matter what the practice, you could be an accountant, it doesn't matter. Um, when you're having this kind of foundational exercise, the foundational concepts and understandings, you could apply that to everything in your life. So it doesn't matter what you're doing in life, by doing the foundational exercises, you're enhancing whatever practice you're doing after that. Absolutely. Sharpen the ax before you chop the wood, people. <laughs> As uh, John Monroe told us in the last week's episode. Well, all right, man. And we'll go over to the other side of the interview now. Take a short break. And thank you so much for coming on with me. It's been super fun so far. Awesome to get to know you. I think we're very kindred. Uh, spirits. Uh, much love, dude. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another phenomenal podcast. I really loved it. Uh, Jason Quit is a kindred spirit. There's actually quite a bit of stuff left on my list of st things to talk to him about. And uh, he said he made the promise he will be back. So that's exciting. Before we get into a little bit more of that, I have to thank a couple of awesome members of the Interverse community, without whom this conversation would not have been possible. First of all, big thanks to my lovely lady friend, Jenny, who told me about Jason Quit. She passed me an interview that he did on a channel called Beyond Mystic with John Claude. Good job, Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Some cool Canadians, Jason Quit being one of them, and Jenny too. And then uh, I had had a little bit of trouble getting through to him on his contact form. I'm sure he was just busy. He let me know that, you know, sometimes we're in the phase of creating and other times we're in the phase of explaining. So I think he would have gotten back to me eventually. But S.B. Alger, our good buddy, Sean, he actually uh, hit Jason up on Twitter and was like, hey, man, you should go on this podcast. And that sort of initiated the process of Jason getting back to me on my uh, contact form from his website, which is a pretty cool website. I do recommend you guys check that out. Uh, I think it's the crystalsun.com. I hope I didn't just say that wrong. I've got the book right here. Yeah, the crystalsun.com. I did it. <laughs> I got it right. This is his book, Egyptian Postures of Power. Not a huge read, as you can see, but full of great interverse adjacent information. So I recommend you pick it up and the practices in there are intriguing to say the least. I could for sure feel the chi flow from doing the postures of power. And there's more practices in there too, like meditations and things worth getting into for sure. Uh, so before I get into talking about some more of my thoughts in the episode and telling you what's in the plus extension, if you guys are listening to just the free hour, First of all, I want to remind you all, and I will keep doing so until October, that in the middle of October, 
is the Music and Sky Festival right there in like middle South California. Check out Music and Sky, Google that festival. If you want more information or check the link in my show notes, you can get a discount on your ticket if you use my code, which will be there in the description. And I'm going to be there. That is being hosted by Alpha Vedic's Mike Winner. Alpha Vedic is probably a show you've heard of. We've had Mike and his co-host Bear Lando on before. It looks like it might be the best festival of all time. I'm not sure, but Soul Fam reunion gathering. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to be walking around with a big tuning fork. So if you find me there, I can tune you up and that'll be my job (laughs) while I'm there, which is pretty much my favorite job. So if you want to know what was in the second hour, uh, well, you can get that on Rockfin or Patreon. You know the drill. Patreon, $5 a month gets you all of my past content, premium shows and things like that for $5 a month. And you get a neat link to put it in your RSS podcast player of choice. So you can have like the updates to your audio feed of the extended shows, or you can do the Rockfin premium option, which is $10 a month, but you get all the creators on Rockfin, all their premium content, highly valuable subscription. If you haven't already, cancel your Cuties Flicks and your Disney Plus and get yourself a Rockfin. Way better infotainment there, no doubt. So in the uh, second hour, we talked about the Egyptian funerary practices to keep a soul connected to the world after death. Kind of like the uh, the how and the why. More on the speculation side with the why, but that was fascinating. And then Jason gave us a really great explanation, something I've been wanting to hear about for a long time from somebody who's well-versed in it. Uh, As you guys know, I've been on an Egypt kick since about the time we had Howdy McCoskey on and I started reading his book. And of course, the Spirit World book series by my buddy Dylan Sicosio, which you can get the audio book of, book three by me, linked in the show notes. Check that out, upgrade your knowledge. Uh, Since I've been into that stuff, the Egypt gravy. Things just keep coming up and I've been pursuing it where I can. And the uh, description Jason gave us of the various bodies that the Egyptians considered our self to be made of, like the Ba, the Ka, the Ren, very fascinating part of the convo, especially the, the Ren, which is the name. We talked about learning from our shadow as the Egyptians understood it, the shadow being actually one of the bodies and the Ib, which is also one of the bodies, AKA the heart, the recorder of all experience. And we talked about astrotheology and the ways that the ancients preserved uh, knowledge through mythology, language, and syncretism. <laughs> and then we tried to do our best talking about like, what is this, this idea of ascension and what is life after death all about? Uh, I asked him some questions about the Egyptian creation cosmologies, of which there are many. And it's right back into that same like emanations from the void or from God or from the source. And then at the end, we talked about the story of Shu, the god Shu, and the pillar of life. Mario will probably love that symbolic studies, Mario, because it's very pole pole star uh, oriented, (laughs) to say the least. But there's so many other things I want to talk to Jason about in a future conversation, like his personal run-ins with Thoth and Osiris. And, you know, more conversation about what it feels like to wake up that plasma in your biofield with Qigong. And how cool is it that this just worked out? I didn't like plan it. That following our Qigong conversation with John Monroe, we have another very Qigong related conversation with Jason Quit. It's pretty perfect. He's also knows, uh, Jason also knows a lot about crystals and has a ton of experience working with crystals. And I would love to talk to him about that. That could fill a good chunk, a good segment of time in a future episode. So yeah, um, there's a lot of things I could talk about. (laughs) Especially that idea of the Ren, your name, and also the idea that the initiates had a secret name that was kept private very much related into a conversation about the public versus the private, the spiritual side of the legal system. Did a great conversation with Slick Dissonant about that at the very beginning of the year. Um, So I'm going to try, you know, I'm not going to be too verbose in this outro. There's a lot of things I could talk about, but some of it I feel like would be recap of things I've talked about before. So instead I want to just leave you with a poem, very short poem, by Khalil 
Gibran, one of my favorite poets. All right. <laughs> it's been a couple weeks since I put this in my notes to read in the outro. So we'll reflect on why I put it there after I read it. We'll see. <laughs> okay. So here's the poem. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks back at the path she has traveled. From the peaks of the mountains, the long winding road crossing forests and villages. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no other way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear. Because that's where the river will know. It's not about disappearing into the ocean, but of becoming the ocean. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that definitely ties into the sort of like ascension topic, if you will, that, <clears throat> you know, I've heard it said the point of like the practices that the initiates get into and uh, the funer funerary rites of the ancient Egyptians has to do with, with the fact that now I'm, I'm not saying that this is a fact, but the belief that upon death, your soul or your being, your consciousness is reabsorbed into the all. And by being absorbed into the all, you sort of lose your individuality and just become everything again. And maybe that maybe the idea of ascension or, you know, life after death is some ability to retain to like avoid, don't go into the light, like they say, to avoid getting absorbed into that light. And from a spiritual existence, continue to maintain your individuality, maybe reincarnate with all your memories of who you are or who you were, who you are, same thing. I find that very interesting. I, for one, would kind of prefer not to cease to exist. <laughs> But then you have that idea of like, well, does that mean you're avoiding union with God or the divine? I don't think so. Can you ever really be separate from that which is the all? I don't think you can. I think it's more about the intention of being able to, the intention and the energy and the attention to hold your boundaries, to hold your own space, to preserve your bubble of self and keep moving forward infinitely. And like that, kind of like the golden mean ratio in mathematics is mirrored by the uh, Fibonacci or the phi in that it gets in, in nature, uh, things never actually perfectly reflect the golden mean, but they get, but as the Fibonacci, which is how nature builds things, gets further and further in its sequence, it gets closer and closer to the exact same ratio as the golden ratio, but never quite gets there. Because it's an infinite journey. Because we're approaching what is infinite, we can continually get closer and closer and closer, but never quite get it there. Kind of like the way that the, uh, the NASA gestures describe black holes. Not that I believe in them as described, but they would say that as you cross the event horizon, like time would slow down as you got closer to the black hole perpetually, and you'd never actually quite get there. You would just get closer and closer and closer and slower and slower and slower. I don't know. It's interesting to consider. But uh, I think I'm going to wrap this outro up. I really enjoyed the Jason Quit talk. That's Q-U-I-T-T. -T. It's quit with two T's. But the best way to get in touch with him or get involved with his work is to go to thecrystalsun.com. And I'm going to play us out with a track by my friend who goes by My Own Eyes. The track is called Byzantine. Pretty cool, groovy new music by my buddy Mike Martin, a.k.a. My Own Eyes. Check the show notes for a link to that. And I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I'll see you on the next one. And uh, oh, one more thing. Make sure you're coming to our Vibrant Wednesday night church. <laughs> it's not really church, but Vibrant's on Wednesday night, 8 p.m. on YouTube and Rockfin. Totally amazing uh, community gather gathers there in the live streams. Really, really fun. and. 
by the time this comes out, we will have just had our first anniversary Vibrant. So I've been doing those for a year now. Where have you been? <laughs> if you haven't been there, uh, it's awesome. And the Telegram community is also where you can keep that connection to the community and the live chat, live video feeling going all day if you want. Really awesome people in there. So enjoy this track by my own eyes, Byzantine, and I will catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. I love you and keep doing what you're doing because they landed you here with me and I appreciate that. It must be working. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>